ओम भद्रम करने भी सुनयाम देवा भद्रम पश्यमाक्षजत्रा स्थिरंगे सुष्टुवाम सस्तनो भिव्यसेम देव किदम यदायु सुस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्ध सवाह सुस्ति न पूषा विश्ववेदा सुस्ति नाक्षो अरिष्ठ नेमि सुस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओं शांति 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 की वी हैव ऑलरेडी एक्सप्लेन शांति मंत्र नाउ वी आर डीलिंग विद दिस सेकंड मंत्र वी ऑलरेडी स्टार्टेड सर्व ह्येतब्रह्म अयमात्मा ब्रह्म स्वयमात्मा चुष्पा वी आर ऑलरेडी एक्सप्लेन बट जस्ट आई वॉन्ट टू रिमाइंड यू फ्यू इंपॉर्टेंट पॉइंट्स इन द फर्स्ट मंत्र द उपनिषद टेल्स अस इदम सर्व ओमी एक अक्षर All that you see around you, the entire cosmic phenomena that you can see and experience, sarvam, all this is the Brahman, the supreme reality itself. That means what you see around you, as world, as jagat, that is Brahman itself at the macro level, at the macrocosm. All that you see around is the supreme reality. The second mantra makes an assertion that supreme reality is within you. I am Atma Brahma. That reality, which expresses itself as the macrocosm, the external phenomena. the rivers the mountains the oceans valleys everything that you can think of that you see with your eyes that you hear with your ears that you pursue through the five senses and mind that you can think of that you can contemplate on all this is the supreme reality the brahman itself at the macro level that means macrocosm is brahman the second mantra says that brahman is i am pointing the finger to our own inner self the upanishad tells us this supreme reality is within you so the second mantra in a way is the source of a very important statement in swami vivekananda's complete works swami ji says um, the macrocosm and microcosm are built on the same plan whatever within us we have finds its expression outside uh, outside in the in sanskrit it's like in the samashti means in the, at the macro level at the universalistic level that reality express itself at the as the entire visible phenomena and the same reality which is omnipresent is also immanent it is within our own inner self that means the entire creation all that you can think of is one supreme reality the unity of oneness of the supreme reality is explained here now a very important technical point which is very important in advaita philosophy i wanted to um, emphasize in this context very often you know in the philosophical tradition we use the word monism advaita or monism is called shankaracharya's philosophy is very often called monistic philosophy in uh, contrast to monotheism in monotheism we project one supreme god with certain characteristics who creates this world creates all human beings and sits apart from this world supervising his creation a personal god 
Now, in monistic tradition, generally speaking, in the philosophic tradition, we uh, formulate a supreme reality as the formless, impersonal, supreme principle. And we use the term monism, but to be more precise, in Vedantic tradition, a more acceptable term is non-dualism. It is not monism. So in all philosophical works, Advaitins use the term ekameva advaitam. Ekameva, I mean the supreme reality is one, it is non-dual. They don't use the word one. It is one, but along with that, another term is used, non-dual. The reason is this. If you use the word monism, ekam, it can imply indirectly a possible existence of plurality or duality. If you use the word one, it has got to correlate you to etc. If you say this is the unity of all, this is one unified whole, it can always uh, indirectly, it can have a correlate you, uh, the possibility of plurality or duality. So in order to philosophically rule out the possibility of duality even as an idea, Advaitin philosophers use the word ekameva advitiya, means one without a second, which is called non-dualism. Now, what this Upanishad tells us is this, what we uh, experience outside as the totality of visible phenomena, which is macrocosm, is not different from what resides within all living beings as the inner essence as the immanent reality, which is microcosm. So, ayamatma brahma, soyamatma chaduspad. Here again, you find saha ayam atma chaduspad, these particular terms. That reality, which was explained earlier, you see the first mantra, the first mantra tells us, Omiti etu takshara midam sarvam tasi upavyakhyanam bhudam bhavat bhavishyat iti sarvam onkar eva yetsa anyatrikala atidam tadapi onkar eva. What the mantra tells is this. What is within time, space, and causation? What is relative? What is experienced within the realm of relative? Within the jurisdiction of time, space, and causation, which comes into existence sometime in the past, which continues to exist, and vanishes sometime in future, which belongs to time, that is trikala adhinam, within time, space, and causation, that is Brahman, and what lies beyond time, space, and causation, trikala atidam, that is also Brahman. This assertion was made. In the second mantra, the Upanishad tells us that reality which has been explained in the first mantra, Saha, means that reality. Ayam Atma Chadushpad. That reality is I am. I am mean you have you have to find out. In Sanskrit language, if you say I am ghataha, means this is a part, then you have you actually uh, are referring to something uh, which uh, which, is, which exists in front of you. So the Upanishad uh, points its finger at you, at all of us, and tells us that the supreme reality, which is Brahman, which is the absolute reality, which is within time, space, and causation, and which is beyond time, space, and causation, it is this Atma, inner essence, is the real, the Brahman itself that we have already dealt with in the previous class. Now it says Chadushpad. Chadushpad actually means 
it consists of four quarters it has got four quarters F each quarter it is a one fourth we have already explained in the previous context the three states of human experience the waking state the dream state and the deep sleep state the atman or brahman which is the omnipresent principle which is transcendent principle and which is immanent in every living being experiences the external phenomena in waking state it's called jagra state so it is a witness of all experiences during jagra states so this atman which is which will be called as turiya in the coming pages is seated in waking state within us it is that that reality which is associated with the atman which is seated within all of us it is called the vishwa so the atman which is witness the experiencer the seer which is experiencing all this during waking state is called vishwa that that is called that is the first quarter the first quarter and the upanishad later will explain it equates with the first letter of uh, omkara is a that will deal with that letter so what are these four quarters that i shall explain the first quarter is a which is the first of the three quarters which constitutes omkara omkara is equated is taken as a symbol remember omkara om pranava is not brahman that should be understood very clearly brahman is the eternal witness which experiences all this during dream state waking state that is waking waking state and also deep sleep state that is the supreme reality but you know from a philosophical point of view this supreme reality is explained with the help of a symbol and the symbol is called pranava or omkara in sanskrit language remember it's only symbol one should never get away with the impression that brahman is omkara the one that sign that you find in any name boards you find omkara or pranava it is not supreme reality it is only symbol that is used in upanishadic terminology in many upanishads and especially in the mandukya method is called the mandukya approach to us um, uh, philosophical analysis so this supreme reality which is omnipresent omniscient and transcendent and immanent experiences all these waking state experiences waking state phenomena and then at that stage in waking state it is called vishwa so it is a drashta it is a witness it is a seer of all waking state experiences but as i said earlier we have another level of experience which is called dream in dream the same reality the self which is identified which i wish actually the chaitanya the supreme reality itself is called taijasa the re there is a reason for this taijasa is something related to tejaha means light in waking state we can have all these experiences it is gross experience 
So you can walk through the street, sunlight is visible. In dream also you walk through the streets of San Francisco. Maybe, and sunlight is visible. But where does the sunlight come from? Your eyes are closed and it is pitch darkness all around. Still you find yourself walking in the streets of San Francisco in dream. And you can also uh, have all the experiences. There, the memories which, have which we have collected during waking state are projected at the mental level. The light which projects all these waking state experiences comes from mind. So in that sense, it is called Taijasah. As I said last time, memory also functions in the same manner. Human memory. In the Bhashya, Shankara's commentary, Shankara uses, he explained this in a very graphic style. Memory and recollection both are very similar to dream. You just, you, uh, in front of you, you see a picture. Then you close your eyes. Then also you can see the picture. But there is a difference. When you close your eyes and then when you see the picture, you are not seeing the picture with your eyes. You are seeing the picture with your mind. In Sanskrit, it's called chittam. It is an internal experience, subtle experience. So that's why dream experiences are subtle. Because senses of perception, like ears, eyes, etc., are not involved. So this is recollection. Memory also. You may l listen to a music, a song this morning. After one week, if you have a good memory, when you try to practice the song, you find you, you can sing as the musician was singing on the stage. Because at the mental level, you are hearing that, that song. That's why you are able to uh, practice it again. If an in fact cognition is possible, perception is possible, recollection is possible only because of memory. This memory and forgetting, they too, they play very, very, very important and sometimes creative, sometimes destructive role in human life. Forgetting and memory. Remember. If if we remember everything, we can never live in this world. Suppose. Uh, a young man or a child has to go through some, some terrible difficulties in his future life. If he, uh, uh, if he undergoes all these problems and then he always remembers all the uh, traumatic experiences, unpleasant experiences, he will not be able to enjoy peace of mind. So the forgetting plays a very important role in human life. At the same time, without memory, human life is also not possible. Without memory, you can never learn anything. We can never remember anything. No human life is possible. So, f memory plays a very important role, and this memory is equated with dream experience by Advaitic philosophers. Now, in dream, what happens is, whatever we experience in waking state, we relive, we re-experience at the subtle level. Every dream experience has got some connection with waking state experience, as I said last time. But they are not identical. There are differences, as I said, Desha Bheda, Kala Bheda, and Sukshma Sthula Bheda. I mean, there is difference with regard to time. In dream, it takes only split second for you to travel thousands of kilometers. In waking state, it takes maybe several hours. And when you are waking, you are, you are living in waking state, you go to sleep in one place and you dream yourself living somewhere else. So there is difference with regard to space. And also, there is a difference with regard to grossness and subtlety, dream experiences are subtle 
and waking state experience are gross. Now, the Upanishad tells us that this Atman is present as drashta or as witness in dream state. And then it is called Taijasa. Again, the same Atman, which will be called Thuriya later, is present in deep sleep state. State deep sleep state means susupti state. So, when it enjoys susupti, it is called prajna. Prajna, in a way, it is called in a prayena prajna. There is a technical point with regard to the word prajna. Means in dream and waking stage, we are aware of what we experience at the time of experiencing. In deep sleep state, we are not aware of our experience when we are experiencing it. We feel that we had a very good sleep only when we return to waking state. So there is an element of ignorance associated with deep sleep state. Another difference is in deep sleep, there is a kind of clouded, unity of experience. There is no plurality in deep sleep state. But in dream and waking experiences, there is plurality. You can see houses, trees, mountains, valleys, different living beings in dream and also waking state experiences. But in deep sleep, there is a clouded, that is Ghani Bhuda, when you should tell later, there is a clouded, darkened, uh, compact, unity of all experiences but we and as a result of this we forget in deep sleep or in susupti uh, we don't have uh, du uh, the experience of duality but we don't transcend duality rather what happens our senses of perception are benumbed they are not able to experience anything in deep sleep at the time of experiencing. Experience is there because this same Thuriya is present in deep sleep also. That's why after Susupti, after deep sleep, when we wake up, we feel that we had a good rest, we had a good sleep. This feeling of relaxation, tranquility, is a clear indication of the fact that same Atman, Turiya, which is present in waking state and also in dream state, was also present in deep sleep state. Otherwise, we won't be able to recollect a feeling of relaxation and tranquility when we wake up. Now, these are the three quarters. Now, the fourth quarter is Turiya. But there is a fundamental difference. Shankaracharya uh, makes a very important point in this analysis of this Chatushpat. That means this Atma, this Turiya consists of four quarters. And he gives an example. You know, four quarters is, a f let us say, the four legs of an elephant. One, two, three, four. Each is, a se each is separate from the other. Now, Shankaracharya would say it is not like that. Then there is another quarter. Say, let us think of one coin. Say, well, uh, a single coin, at least, in, you know, the, in the commentary on this Kariga, uh, Shankaracharya used the word Kashapanam. Let us say, uh, I will, for your convenience, I shall say one dollar coin. Maybe there, I don't know if this coin exists or not. Let us assume there is a one dollar coin, let us say. Now, and also there is a quarter coin, half coin, and three-fourth of a dollar coin. To understand, I'm, I'm trying to translate Karshapana, which is used in Shankara's commentary, written in the 8th century, mind you. I'm trans trying to put it in modern terminology. Suppose there is a single a coin for one dollar and also there are smaller coins one fourth of a dollar half a dollar and three fourth of a dollar 
Now, um, one fourth of it, if you place half dollar one co uh, coin and one fourth of a dollar coin, you can say the one fourth merges in half dollar coin. And half dollar and one fourth of a dollar merge in single dollar coin. Similarly, waking state merges with dream state. And dream and waking state experiences merge in deep sleep state. And all the three states merge in Thuriya state and Thuriya, the fourth state, goes beyond all this. That is the state of the experience that we are the Atman, that I am the Atman, which is transcendent, immanent, omniscient and omnipresent. So, this is a point which Bhashikara makes very clearly. Each of the state merges with the, in the succeeding state. The reason is this. Our experience begins with waking state. And uh, our dream state experiences are both related and also unrelated with waking state experience. As I said last time, we generally we can never have a dream experience which is completely different from waking state experiences. Though there are differences, I already outlined three types of differences between dream state and also waking state experiences. But at the same time, every dream state experience is one way or other related to uh, waking state experience. If somebody argues, well, I had a dream which is in no way connected with any of my past waking state experiences, then Vedanta would tell you it may have some connection with your experience in previous life. That's why, you know, some, some people can never stand for a moment any discussion on high Vedantic philosophy. It is impossible. Some people can never even bear to uh, sit and patiently listen to any spiritual relig religious ideas. And there are some people who can never withstand discussion on, uh, on maintain worldly topics. Two extremes you find. It is not genetic, you may, not genetic. Uh, maybe in the same family there may be five brothers, children of the same parents, with five entirely different characteristics. So there are genetic factors, there are of course inherited factors, but there are also certain essential characteristics that we, uh, that we inherit from previous life. That's what Vedanta would tell you. Because we cannot behave in a we cannot help behaving in a particular manner. There are certain there are certain methods and manners in which we we um, invariably behave in a particular manner. These are all characteristics which are related to our previous life and which practice actually constitute the subtle part of our character. The subtle, the unchanging, the changeless aspect of our character. Now, Chadushpad. So, these four quarters. These four quarters are the waking state, dream state, deep sleep state, and also the transcendental state, which is called Thuriya. So, in a way, the Thuriya is not the fourth state. It is used, that particular term is used, as I said last time, you know, in, I mean, in the, I mean, in the days when Upanishads evolved, philosophy was highly evolved, but uh, language was still in its stage of infancy. So very often, there is a limitation of language in expressing 
high philosophical truths. So it's called, it, it is stated here, it is a fourth state. Fourth state means it's actually, it's the state which contains all the th other three states, but also goes beyond it. Because it is that Turiya which uh, is present in waking state, in dream state, and also in deep sleep state. That's why it is said, you know, Vishwa, that is the experiencer of dream, uh, the experiencer of waking state, merges with Taijasa, the experiencer of dream state. And both merge in Prajna, the experiencer of deep sleep or Sushupti state. And all the three merge in Turiya, and Turiya goes beyond all this. That second mantra. Now, third mantra is going to explain in a more graphic manner the point which I made in the beginning, that is the unity of um, macrocosm and microcosm. Swamiji, I said, you know, Swamiji had a wonderful experience when he was traveling through the Himalayas, Swami Vivekananda. And near Almora, somewhere, there was a big banyan tree, and he sat under it, and uh, he had a mystical experience. He felt that every single uh, unseen, subtle element, you may call molecule, or still going further down, we can say the smallest atom or molecule, whatever it is. And also the entire cosmic phenomena, the macrocosm, both are built on the same plan. This is what this is a statement which Swamiji makes. That idea uh, originates from the verse which I am going to take right now. That is this Jagrida Sthano Bhakish Praknyaha Saptanga Ekoana Vimsadi Mukha Sthula Bhuk Vaishwanaraha Prathama Padaka. This is the third mantra. So, how these four quarters are, uh, are located, that is being explained here. So, these four quarters, they indicate Atman, and is the explanation. The first quarter is Vaishwanara. So, Vaishwanara is a universal in human form, the pure consciousness when it is associated with the gross bodies of creation. At the, as the totality of experiences as objects, it's called Vaishwanara or Virat, in the cosmic phenomena. That is Drishyam, what is seen. And as see and a seer, the experience is called Vishwa. Now, I shall just what I'm going to explain later, I shall indicate at this stage. That will make you get a, get, give, give a better uh, picture as to, as to how the Upanishads is trying to establish the unity of macrocosm and microcosm. I already explained that uh, whatever we experience in waking state merges with the experiences of dream states, and both merge in the experience of um, susupti or dre uh, dreamless sleep state, and all the three merge into the uh, Again, so this is the, this with regard to objects, what called drishya, whatever is experienced so whatever is experienced or whatever we experience in waking, dream and dreamless sleep state, they merge into the uh, Again, the experiencer, the seer, the witness as Vishwa, the self, the Atman which is seated within every living being which experiences waking state experiences merges in prajna which is a witness of dream state and both again merge in in the seer the witness of susupti state 
which is called prajna and all the three merge in the witness as thuriya in the transcendental state so there is a unity not only at vertical level but also the horizontal level the upanishad ultimately wants to tell you that the entire existence is one reality this one one may argue why don't why, why can't the upanishad straight away make a statement well the whole creation is one whole existence is one that is true for a highly evolved soul who is not um, very who is not tempted by the plurality of duality of experiences this is enough the reality is one you are remember uh, the history in the in the life of sri ramakrishna paramahamsa his teacher the great teacher totapuri advaita teacher who experienced this supreme reality who had this advaitic experience as a result of nearly 40 years of spiritual practices on the banks of narmada in india that great advaitic teacher came to the ekshaneshwar was sri ramakrishna was living so he found that this young man is an extremely fit spiritual aspirant because he is not at all interested in the duality or plurality of in the manifold worldly phenomena his natural tendency is to contemplate on that supreme transcendental reality but he had not undergone any formal training in advaitic or non dualistic spiritual practices so tota puri this great teacher comes to siramakshra and he trained him the moment he uttered tattvamasi the mahavakya you know mahava tattvamasi there are four important statements in the vedic literature in the upanishad literature which i already explained last time that is called these are called mahavakyas or great statements tattvamasi occurs in chandogya upanishad belonging to samaveda aham brahmasmi it occurs in brihadaranika upanishad which belongs to yajurveda ayam atma brahma which we are studying now it occurs in mandukya upanishad which belongs to atharva veda and prajnanam brahma which is found in aitireya upanishad it belongs to rigveda now when a teacher instructs his student tattvamasi that brahman that reality is yourself this is explained in a long dialogue in chandogya upanishad 6th chapter long chapter the essence of the chapter is this the teacher uddalaga instructs his disciple but they are both father and son uddalaga is the father shwetakidu is the son and also disciple the father teaches the son tattvamasi you are that supreme reality this is the instruction it is spread over long chapter with so many sections now totapuri the great advaitic teacher uh, taught sri ramakrishna the moment totapuri uttered this mystic mantra sri ramakrishna realized immediately he got the spiritual experience because sri ramakrishna's mind was so pure it was naturally god oriented it was naturally it was established at a transcendental plane so sri ramakrishna paramahamsa immediately got that mystical experience the moment teacher uttered this mantra tattvamasi immediately he realized aham brahmasmi i am that supreme brahman but for an ordinary aspirant this will not work for an ordinary aspirant for an ordinary spiritual student he is under the strong conviction that brahma mithya jagat satyam that is the normal conviction of any ordinary man world is real god is an illusion this is the normal conviction 
I don't say intellectual conviction, but this is the plane in which the mind of an ordinary person works. Because he is convinced of the reality of the dual, dual, dualistic experience, the pluralistic experience. So, first of all, his mind should be drawn away from plurality and slowly it should be diverted inward and then slowly the, stu the teacher has to take him stage by stage to a philosophical conviction and then to the level of mystical experience. Therefore, the Upanishad, first of all, asks you to look around the world and to look at yourself and then see the unity between the totality of microcosm and the totality of mic macrocosm. So that should be understood. We'll explain this. Jagridasthano bhakish praknyaka. Now, the first quarter is Vaishwanara. That is explained here. Now, Vaishwanara is functions at the waking state, at the gross level. And it is conscious of the external objects. It's because it's related to waking state. During waking state, we naturally experience external visible objects. And this Vaishwanara has got seven limbs. We will explain this. Seven limbs. How we normally interact with the external phenomena. We see with our eyes, we hear with our ears and so on. So how we normally interact or come in contact with the external phenomena during the waking states. So this mantra says, the first quarter, which is Vaishwanara, which is related to waking states and who is conscious of external objects, the plurality of uh, uh, phenomena it has got seven limbs and 19 mouths and experiences gross objects. This is the mantra. I shall explain one after another. Now first I shall explain this the seven limbs that is saptangaha. You can find in the mantra saptangaha mean the one who has got seven limbs. Two words are used in this mantra, saptangaha. This Vaishwanara, the one who, ex who the, the experiencer of waking states, the experiencer of these external objects, has got seven limbs and 19 mouths. Ekona vimshadi mukhaha. Ekona vimshadi means 19 Mukha means mouths. It may appear a bit puzzling, but it is a very simple. And it not only that, it is not philosophy. It's a matter of human experience. In Vedanta, one interesting point is, Vedanta is not explaining anything other than yourself. It just tells you what you are. It explains to us what we are. So, the language may be somewhat complex. The moment we understand it, it is very simple because it explains our own inner reality. Now, seven limbs of the Saptanka. This is this this particular portion of this Upanishad is based on one well-known verse in Chandogya Upanishad. I shall explain it later. But what are these seven limbs? One is head. Head is the celestial region. I mean the higher regions. Let us say this, what you call heavens, celestial regions above. You think of the entire cosmos. On the one hand you can find within us this experiencer is there. Which is Vishwa. At the micro level and that reality has got a counterpart at the 
macro level. That's why it's stated here. So it has got seven limbs. One is head, and head is the effulgent, the transcendental region, celestial regions. What is the eye? Eye is the sun. If you see with your eyes, and if the eye is the instrument through which you see the objects in around you, then the, for the cosmic person, what is the eye? Surya or the sun is the eye, because sun is symbolic of light. In fact, the function of eye is to see. The very idea of seeing is related to the existence of sun. So, if head is the the higher region of the individual, that the, the, at the micro level, then the celestial regions is the head of the cosmic person at the macro level. Remember Swamiji's statement: macrocosm and microcosm are built on the same plane. Whatever we have got within is nothing but a miniature of the entire cosmic phenomenon. That's right. So we have head at the micro level, and for the cosmic person, what is the head? The celestial regions. We have the eyes with which you see, and for the cosmic person, the eye is the sun. Again, we breathe. What we call in Sanskrit is called prana, which has got five functions. That's what keeps the body intact. For the cosmic person, that prana, the breath is air. Again, we have this middle part of the body. For the cosmic person, for the at the macro level, it is akasha, the ether. And then, <coughs> we, for the, for the individual person, his kidney is there. For the cosmic person, it is the water principle. Now, these are this, then Akhavaniyak. These stated here. That is a particular fire. Remember, these are all symbols. You have to remember symbols. Well, you may ask the question. But the entire human body is not mentioned here. These seven limbs are mentioned uh, in a symbolic way. What the Upanishad wants to tell you is this. Whatever we have got within this simple miniature human body is nothing but a miniaturization, is a, is a small addition of the entire cosmic phenomena. That's what the Upanishad wants to tell you. No, Ahavani Agni is mentioned here, you know. <coughs> Means it's a ritual, it's a fire. Now, <coughs> that is his mouth. Now, this is the symbolic presentation of the unity of macrocosm and microcosm. Now, that's why. Uh, when, a, when a spiritually enlightened man gets this kind of mystical experience, the most fundamental characteristic that you find in him is that he looks at the entire creation as one. In all Vedantic li literature, you find there are characteristics mentioned of highly evolved spiritual personalities. But one common characteristic, whether he is a devotee, bhakta, jnani, anybody who just steps outside the formalistic religion, the mechanistic religion, and who gets a flash of that mystical, spiritual experience, the first characteristic that comes to him naturally is the ability to see the entire humanity as one spiritual family. What he experiences is nothing but the unity of macrocosm and microcosm. 
the, in fact, we cannot actually explain in totality the characteristics of a man of this high mystical experience. We cannot explain because uh, he becomes as inexplicable as the experience itself. But one important characteristic that is mentioned in all Vedantic literature, even in the great bhakti literature, is the moment you step out of formalistic religion, the moment you realize that there is a, that God in his highest dimension is one supreme principle who is omnipresent, omniscient, and transcendent and immanent. The moment you realize that truth is, the moment you realize, you get a flash of that truth, you become broad-minded. You start looking at the entire humanity as one spiritual entity. I can explain this uh, before going further. I can, I can drive home this point. What really happens to a man who experiences this? The unity of macrocosm and microcosm. In the Bhagavata Purana, it's a famous devotional work. There is a description of three types of devotees. Three types of people who take to spiritual life. The most primitive and those who are slightly advanced and those who are those who reach the highest level of God consciousness. I won't go into the first two levels but the Purana tells us what exactly happens to a man who realizes who reaches this level of uh, mystical unity. Sarva bhude shuya pasyed bhagavad bhavam atmanaha bhutani bhagavadi atmani esha bhagavadottamaha. This is the Sanskrit verse I shall explain in English. <coughs> Such a person, the one who reaches the highest mystical experience of devotion, bhagavadottamaha means he is the he is the noblest type of devotee. He, he experiences the presence of God in all living beings. And he experiences the presence of all living beings in God. He experiences the presence of God, the spark of the divine principle in all living beings. And he experiences the presence of all living beings in God. This idea of unity is what the central principle of all mystical experiences. Now, <coughs> the Upanishad uses another technical term, ekoana vimshadi mukha. That also I shall explain further. <coughs> now, That uh, Vaishwanara, the cosmic um, person, has got 19 mouths. These 19 mouths are explained here. Here, we have to remember, Saptanga refers to the cosmic person because just as a man has got eyes with which he sees external objects, the cosmic person has got sun. Just as he has got his head, the cosmic person has got the celestial regions. Just as a man at the, at the micro level, he has got breath, the cosmic person has got air, and so on. Now, these 19, uh, 19 mouths are related to the 19 parts of, a, of an individual. That's being explained here. <coughs> Which are these 19 mouths? Because it is through these 19 mouths that he uh, understands, interacts with the external world. These are five organs of perception. Now, five organs of perception are this... <coughs> For example, you see, sight, the organs of sight, sound, smell, 
taste and mouth these are the five organs of perception so five we already got again five organs of action five organs of action are hands feet then organs of speech generation and evacuation these are the five organs of action <coughs> and again the five aspects of prana means vital breath five aspects of prana bisko prana apana vyana udana samahan samana according to hindu tradition the prana the air and the energy which uh, operates and activates the human body functions at five different levels so this is this are, so total we have got five five plus five plus five total 15 that is first five senses of perception panchak jnanendriyas or buddhindriyas then five uh, senses of action karmendriyas then five dimensions five levels of breath pancha prana so total 15 then there are four more one is mana buddhi chitta and ahankara these are the four which together constitute what is called antakarana now here i i can just uh, mention you know normally a human being um has got this first 15 factors and they are guided by four important factors mana buddhi chitta and ahankara let us uh, in modern english let us say these are the four levels of human impressions the vedantic text explain this in a very simple manner if well, suppose you see an object in front of you from a distance you are not sure what that object is we you you we you may you so is in front of you if you see a pillar in semi darkness when there is not enough light you may be confused whether it's a figure of a man or a pillar at that stage your mind is functioning your impressions are functioning at the mental level when you approach the objects and when you are convinced that when you 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 use a torch if you are convinced it is a, just a pillar not a human being not the figure of a human being then buddhi your buddhi intellect functions because you come to a definite conclusion that it is a pillar not the figure of a human being nisyatmika antakarna vrittihi buddhi sankalpa vikalpatmika antakarna vrittihi mana these are the two definitions for your convenience i shall explain mind is nothing but the impression mental impressions functioning as doubts or understanding is it pillar is a human being mind is functioning you come to a conclusion it is a pillar not a human being buddhi intellect is functioning you come to definition definite conclusion as to what object is now at the third stage you may remember this is the pillar which i saw last night you identify yourself as the one who has seen the pillar or you identify the pillar as the object which you have seen the previous night your aham this particular impression is functioning now again later you have memory of seeing this pillar in front of you this this experience registers itself as an impression some somewhere in in a corner of our mind this at this level the impressions are called chitta these are the four types of operations of human impressions that is these four constitute the last four modes of this individual so at at the macro level the sun is the eye of the cosmic person the celestial regions are the head ether the space is the middle part of the body 
And the air is the vital air, etc. At the macro level, with regard to the cosmic person. At the micro level for the individual, the five senses of perception, the five senses of action, and the five types of operation of the air, pancha pranas, plus mana, buddhi, chitta, and ahangara. As I explained last time, the four levels of the function of impressions. This is how we live in this world. Human life is nothing other than nothing other than a combination of these 19. That is what is called. In other scriptures, the Vedantic scriptures make another point. What is human life? Human life is nothing but a continuation through the wheel of life, death and rebirth. Using a vehicle which consists of these 19 principles. That is Panjak Jnanendriyas means five senses of perception, five senses of action, Panjak Armendriyas, Pancha Pranas, five vital air, plus Mana, Buddhi, Chitta and Ahangara. I have already explained. Sometimes, of course, it is called Sukshma Sharira, sometimes it is called subtle body. Somebody called Buddhi and Mind. Mind and intellect alone are mentioned. Somebody is called 17 mouths. But the other two are also included. So this is what human being is. At the micro level, we travel through the cycle of life, actions, death, rebirth, and again continuing this game of life. And we use a vehicle, something like a motor car. And this vehicle consists of the 17 parts. So that's, now, this is at the micro level, at the individual level. It is, in fact, non-different, non-distinct from the cosmic phenomena. That means, what is within us is the same as what is without us. What is outside and what is within are the same. As Swamiji said, the microcosm and macrocosm are built on the same plan. That is, in a sense, the central theme of this Upanishad. Now, there are a few more points to be explained with regard to this mantra. Jagridasthana <coughs> bhagishpraknyaka. Now, as I explained, in waking, Jagridasthana means in waking state, the experiencer, the Turiya, the Atma, functioning as seer or witness in waking state. It sees external objects. It is oriented towards external objects. Behish Prajna means it is oriented towards external experiences. And it has got these seven limbs at the macro level, at the cosmic level, and 19 mouths at the individual level. This is the first experience, and this waking state experiencer is the first stage, because from waking state only we go to dream state. Dream state, in fact, we are in waking state, we are preparing a background for dream. You if you see a nightmare, it's because you had a very unpleasant, frightening experience somewhere, sometime in the past, in waking states. Or you have a blissful experience because you have prepared a background sometime, somewhere in the past, if not in this life, in the previous life. So, waking state is the, is the first stage of experience. That's why it is called Prathama Pada, I mean the first quarter. Okay. Last time I got a small notice. One of our friends, devotees, requested me to give you some, give you time for asking some questions at the end of the class or 
maybe once a week or at the end of four or five classes every week is left to you if you have got anything to ask on what i have explained today you can ask i don't think anybody would have any doubt but if you are not very clear as to what you would like to ask you can ask after four or five classes is left to you if i got anything to ask right now you can ask otherwise i shall conclude right now om shanti 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 hari om tat sat shri ram shri ram parmesh